Welcome to the Calder Farmstead, your place for news, analysis, and shenanigans from the American Hockey League. He's on one back on, or Jones, top of the point, bends into the slot, a shot, and Josh Murray, in double, oh! Left point, long drive, she can run it, what a stop by Matisse with the left pad! Oh, there was a scramble in front of the net, denied with Max Schechter by a miraculous piece of net finding by Matisse, can run it! Delaner from the red line, sends it in, hope for another net, he stops it, hope for looking, hope for Scott in overtime, the Bears breaking out, right side with Fair, looks like cutting to the net, Fair and let's go! Hello, hello, hello from Nykoping, Sweden. And Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 121 for Thursday, December 8th, 2022. If you're hoping for a podcast featuring guides to winterizing tack rooms and wash racks, we're not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast. My name is Sean O'Brien from Stats Track and the only and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And my name is Sarah Avampato from Full Press Hockey and also SB Nation's Canes Country. As always, we thank you for tuning tuning in with us. And if you're new to hearing Sarah and I talk about hockey, we're going to talk about some news as well as dive in and discuss the goings on of eight teams around the AHL. Two from each division. We both watch a lot of AHL games. I'm going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break that down. If that's new to you, you might want to head over to our uh, podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us from, and check out episode zero. It's all the way at the bottom. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms, like PDO or the point shares model, or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries or Royal Road, go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical, and let's be honest, it's only 20 minutes, and let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes watching the World Cup. If Americans wanted to watch their countrymen run around a big field and not score, then the Denver Broncos wouldn't have gotten flexed out of two primetime games this season. You'll never get that time back. So next time, why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Before we dive into some teams, though, we do have some very quick uh, news and notes from around the league that seems pertinent enough to mention here in passing. Um, Number one, and this just broke uh, out today, uh, we're recording here Wednesday night, uh, that uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins uh, forward Sam Poulin is uh, taking a step back from hockey for a little bit. He's taking a leave of absence from the team. Um, the reasons for this leave of absence have not been stated, nor will we try and speculate about it. Um, but he is going to head back to his home in Quebec to be with friends and family and continue to work out on and off the ice up there for an indefinite period of time. Um Best wishes to Sam Poulin, as it seems pretty clear that um, if you're taking a step away from something like this, uh, not everything is going great. Uh, So we hope that he's doing well. Uh, Sarah, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, I I would echo that. You know, I just wish wish the best for him and his family, whatever was going on with them. But just, you know, in general, I feel like it's it's the league and the sport moving in a positive direction that players even feel – enabled to do something like this you know for whatever reason it is um for him to be able to say to his team i need to go away for a little bit and for them to be okay with it um i think is really important you know we spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about players and their mental health and their well-being and everything you know as people off the ice and seeing an example like this i think speaks really well that um there are at least some teams that are moving forward in in the way that they allow their players to be people off the ice too. Yeah, I think that's good too. I think this is a moment that 20 years ago, you know, the player would have just, you know, uh, drank himself to death instead of uh, doing something. So I I think this is, uh, I mean, all the best to him. I hope uh, it works out uh, one way or the other. Second piece of news, a real small tidbit here, because we don't see these kind of moves that often. Uh, Max Gildon loaned from Charlotte to Bakersfield. Uh, not too often that you see uh, an AHL player who's still, I think, considered a prospect uh, for a team decide that he's going to get loaned to a different AHL team that is not the AHL affiliate of the NHL club. 
but especially one that is, you know, pretty much as far away as you possibly could. Um, Gildan played for Bakersfield in the bubble year, had some good success there uh, as Charlotte um, did not play that season. So they kind of Florida just scattered their guys to the wind and said, best of luck to you, sirs, uh, for most for the most part. Um, or were they a dual affiliate team? I genuinely no, I try. Think, I think I think Charlotte just noped out for that year. Yeah, because Utica was a dual affiliate, but it was like Vancouver and someone else. Vancouver yeah, and something weird. No, uh, Syracuse played. Yeah, I don't remember. But I do remember that he played in Bakersfield and did quite well there that year. And then last year in, with the double affiliates, didn't like he seemed to get the short end of the stick for a lot of things just because there were so many good defensemen on that team that it was hard for him to crack. And he doesn't seem like he's managed to struck, strike a chord this year. So, I mean, that's good. He seems to be going back to the place where he had success with, you know, uh, at least a staff that he has some remnants of his time there on it. Um, so I, I, that's a smart move for Florida too, who is not exactly well known for bringing guys up through the system and develop, developing them. Um, so th this is probably the best shot for everyone involved here. So, uh, Good on good on Florida for that. Good luck to Max Gildon. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see if he can find some of that magic from 2021. But it seems like in general most players uh, have not had good success uh, finding the magic from that weird yeah. and diluted AHL year. So that being said, let's talk uh, about some AHL teams in specific and dive in here. Let's start as we always do, Atlantic to Pacific. We're gonna go with. The Hartford Wolfpack. Sarah, get us started. All right. So we are starting with Hartford, but a little note from us to you. We record these shows on Wednesday night. Uh, so this analysis isn't really going to include anything from the game versus Lehigh Valley. Um, it just wrapped up before we, we, we uh, recorded. We were watching to see if they were going to blow it. Um, they didn't. So good job, Hartford. Um, but really, the last time we checked in with Hartford overall, they were struggling. Um, and when we talked about them, you cited their transition, the rebound control from their goaltenders, um, and just general bad luck as some reasons for their struggles. So here we are again with another look at Hartford. And are they still aboard the struggle bus? And has anything really changed for them yet? I would say some things have changed. But yes, they are obviously still aboard the struggle bus here. Um, you know, game against Lehigh Valley notwithstanding. I, we saw the last, but two minutes of that game just to, it's like, oh, it's close now. Let's peek in here before we hit record. But I'm... Um, I will say the transition game has gotten better. Is it great? No, nope. But it's at least passable for the most part. They're still having some moments in their own zone for sure, but they aren't really a lot of prolonged sequences of them kind of shooting themselves in the foot by and large. It happens to every team every once in a while that they make those kind of plays. And it's still happening a little more frequently than anyone would like, but that doesn't seem to be their core problem anymore. Um, rebound from rebound control from goaltenders has also gotten somewhat better, which is something I kind of thought would be the case at the time. Um, like the transition game, it's not great, but it's passable for the most part. We're not seeing, you know, either goaltender, uh, Grand or Deming, uh, you know, just kick out rebounds into juicy places that they shouldn't be. In terms of bad luck, though, uh, nope, that has not changed a single bit. Uh, in all situations, PDO, their uh, Hartford is 97.38. If you've never heard of that term PDO before, as always, highly recommend you go watch our episode zero. We'll give you a much more thorough breakdown of it. But in general, you want a PDO is a, PDO is a uh, proxy for puck luck. You want that number for a PDO to be at exactly 100. And anything that's more than a point or two more or a point or two less than 100 is usually unsustainable in good luck or bad luck. So higher PDO, good luck. Lower PDO, bad luck. 97.38 is terrible. Um, and that's they are the worst shooting percentage team in the AHL. Uh, their estimated PDO is 97.44. So that's not even, like, it's bad no matter how you try and slice it in terms of puck luck. And they're tied for the worst shooting percentage in the AHL with Lehigh Valley of all teams. Uh, and watching the film is just an exercise in frustration. Um, I, I think maybe my favorite sequence was in the Rockford game that they played uh, a little bit ago. The Wolfpack for, force a turnover in the neutral zone with good forechecking, generate an odd man rush the other way. Rushoff gets off a high danger, clean shot from the inner slot, gets stopped. Wolfpack once again forecheck reasonably well uh, on the rebound, get a recovery at the point where Brandon Scalen just kind of flings one hopelessly at the net. Uh, he misses a wide open CJ Smith in the slot, but you know, he's 
Brandon Scanlon. Expecting that level of offensive vision from him is really probably asking too much. Um, but that prayer from the blue line does get answered in a sense uh, that a bad rebound is given up by Jackson Stauber because he's, well, Jackson Stauber. Rushoff gets the rebound, gets another high danger scoring chance from the inner slot that Stauber somehow comes up with. And you could see this like quick moment where Rushoff just like looks to the sky and is like, what, what, why did you forsaken me? Uh, the ice hogs recover, get a zone exit, look to dump and change. The dump in takes this fluky bounce off of what looks like Louis Deming's skate behind the net as he tries to play it, deflects right into this slot to Tyler Security and just taps it in the empty net. One nothing Rockford. And it's just, that's a display of cruelness from the hockey gods that's just soul crushing. And that's not an isolated incident for the Wolfpack either. I mean, against Providence, literally the best team in the AHL by points. I thought they were clearly the better team, but Kincaid decided he was going to pull some revenge on this one as it's his first game against his team from last year and just stood on his head. Meanwhile, Dylan Garand let in three goals that were so soft. Charmin contacted him for advertising rights. Um, but to show some examples here that Hartford isn't just getting blasted into the sun night in and night out, we're going to play a little game, Sarah, called Orange or Blue. No. It's a very simple game. Uh, I'm going to show you some shot charts here, Sarah. Uh, and they're from the AHL website, which we've talked about in terms of accuracy. Um, but these are from Hartford's last five games with the teams redacted. So you're just going to see orange things and blue things. And you're going to just guess based simply on what, what, what the shot chart looks like. Who won the game? Are you ready, Sarah? Yes, let's do it. Okay, first up here. Orange or blue? I feel like I feel like this is the equivalent of a trap game, like this entire thing. Like, I feel like it's just going to be the opposite of what I want it to be. And so I'm going to go with orange on this one. But like this one looks close, though, right? Like this. Right. Could go it's, yeah. It's yeah. not outrageous. They're both getting to the net. Yeah. All right. Uh, this was against uh, the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. The uh, Hartford Wolfpack lost six to three. That is a six to three losing shot map. All right. Second game here. How about this guy? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like I I'm I'm just gonna keep going with, with the one that looks like it should have lot like I'm gonna go with blue wins the game because they shouldn't have. <laughs> Actually, no, Orange took this one. This is a one-nothing loss to Hershey, but like Orange clearly dominating yes. the, the, the shots here. All right. Game number three. Let's go with blue wins the game. I got to get one of these right eventually. Yeah. I mean, blue is just dominating the, the yeah. inner slot there for shots. Uh, nope. Two, one loss yeah. to Hershey by Wolfpack. <laughs> the Wolfpack were blue. <laughs> so that's at least one game that you're like, okay, the Wolfpack probably should have won this. Right. And just didn't. At least yeah. the one against Bridgeport was close-ish. They got banked by, they got banged by Hershey in that one, nothing one. Game number four here. <laughs> what happened in this one? <laughs> the I like I have to go with orange wins because th it just feels embarrassing. If, like, why why are all the shots right in front of the net? This is really bad for the orange team. <laughs> yeah, like blue blue is clearly the better team here by right. shot. Yeah, uh, yeah. This was a two three to two loss to Rockford. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's so Last bad. <laughs> yeah, like. Hartford is doing everything they need to do here and just cannot win this game. All right, last one. Um, let's go with orange wins. Nope. Three one loss at Providence. Like, that's at least two games that you seem to no notice that like right. the, the Hartford should have at least been able yeah. to pull out those games out shooting them in highest danger scoring areas. And yeah. just nope, nope, they could not. And yes, there's some score effects baked into this. Uh, I realized that by having watched these games, you know, when you're up three to nothing, two to nothing, whatever, going into the second period, third period, you don't need to score more to win. That's why you see teams being outshot, but still winning. But at the same point, it's like, Jesus, can, like mm -hmm. a perfect example of, you know, Hartford just cannot catch a break here, but not everything about this team is bad luck. Um, the bottom six of this roster needs to get broken up and balanced somehow. Um, in their last two games, their bottom six line or their bottom two lines were some combination of 
Di Jacinto, Waylon Carlson, and Rempe Lohan, and Blake Hillman, a defenseman playing fourth line wing. Why? I don't know. I could not explain that one, but, but I, I'm imagining it was injury and they couldn't find a call up in time because their ECHL affiliate is Jacksonville for no reason. <laughs> and, or at least it was last season. ECHL affiliates are made up anyway, but like there's plenty of ECHL teams in that neighborhood, but whatever. I, but as a group, they're not as terrible as you think. They're surprisingly effective four checkers, and they showed that numerous times on tape from the past few games, that they can get effective pressure and force turnovers on dumped-in pucks. But they're like the world's best dog-chasing cars. They're, they catch the car on a regular basis, but they have no idea what to do when they catch it. To translate that into hockey terms, these two lines four check effectively, or at least more effectively than you would think given the talent on that team. But like when they get turnovers, they can't turn those pucks into meaningful offense. Their off-puck awareness in the cycle is atrocious, and they just stand around instead of looking for opportunities to support the play, create space for themselves, um, you know, create space for the puck carrier, anything like that. They don't attack the middle. They can't sustain a cycle. So basically, they are a dog chasing a car. When they catch the car, oh, what happens next? I don't know. And... Yes, no team's bottom six is being relied on to carry a team's offense, but Hartford isn't a top-heavy team full of top six star power like, say, Calgary is with Phillips, Pelte, and Zary. I mean, even last year's Calder Cup champion Wolves team was very top-heavy, and that didn't matter because those guys got the job done. So Hartford needs that bottom six to chip in once in a while, especially when the top six is ice cold in terms of finding the net despite creating scoring chances. And Hartford's bottom six just cannot create offense despite creating good opportunities and forechecking turnovers that better teams and more capable players can do that. So what I suggest is splitting up the top six a bit and trying to add some more offensive skill down the lineup. So at least one guy on each line you can trust to do something when a good moment like a forechecking turnover in the offensive zone happens. Like, let Alex Whalen or Matt Rempe be the first forechecker, cause chaos, and when they do get a turnover, they can find Bobby T or CJ Smith or someone else, and they can figure out how to make the offense happen. Um, some other things really quick here, too, dragging down Hartford. Uh, their special teams, their penalty kill is an absolute gong show. It's maddeningly passive in zone. You've heard me a million times before on this podcast yell, if you aren't going to pressure puck carriers on the power play in zone, why bother existing? Um, their team also doesn't forecheck very well on the penalty kill. They're just letting guys right in the zone. It's it's just bad. Um, power play zone entries are bad. Uh, they don't use the double drop play. Instead, they use the center lane entry play. Um, it's 2022. Either get busy using the double drop play and teaching your team how to do it or get busy inventing a more effective way to gain the power play zone because the center lane play that they use and uh, one or two other teams use around the league, those are not good power plays and it's reflected in the numbers. Um, the power play unit also needs to either give that top unit 75% of the power play time or spread the talent out to balance both units because giving half the power play to a second unit of Elson, Whalen, Henriksen, Hillman, and Robertson is just bonkers. That was their second power play unit in the game against Providence. And I was just like, you put Blake Hillman out there with like 38 seconds of power play time left or something like that. And I was just like, I had to hit pause and like make sure I'm like, no, that's, that is kind of confirmed. There is power play time and Blake Hillman on the ice. Help me, Jesus. Um, but Andy Walensky is on the roster, just saying. And I saw that he scored a power play goal tonight as we're recording here. So something is going right over there. I mean, all in all, is Hartford a contending team? No, no, it's not. Are they a trash team? No, I, I don't think so. They're 29th in the AHL at time of recording down there with Chicago, Henderson, and San Diego. And I refuse to believe that they're that bad. They're not good, but they should at least be, you know, flirting with a 500 record uh, at this point. I swear this team's shooting percentage has to go up. They're generating quality scoring chances, but the hockey gods just, as you saw from playing orange or blue, just <laughs> do not like them. There are other problems here that we talk about, but this team in no way should be this bad. Like, they're not great. They're probably not good, but they they should at least be coming close to a 500 record. Like, I I don't accept that this team is this bad, and I swear that better days are ahead. I swear it. 
there's that plenty Rockford, more we can use. The, 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 just the, the Rockford shot map is going to be like in my oh, nightmares. Like that's it's, so bad. It, it really is. And like Rockford, Rockford does some magical things in the offensive zone that other teams don't. I sent you the clip of one and talked yeah. about it on Twitter. But like you – they really were the better team. I thought they were the better team against Providence, the best team in the AHL by standings. And I thought they outplayed them, yeah. but Keith Kincaid just said, nah. <laughs> so it, that's, that's hard. And they've played other games where they haven't been the best team, but they're still not this bad. It's in or the shootout. Like if they win two of those, they're at least pressing teams above them in the standings. So it's, it's hard to really be that down on Hartford at this point, too. Um, but, Sarah, any thoughts uh, outside of the Rockford shot map there? Just Yeah, I mean, I feel like this was, even whenever we previewed the season, you know, I feel like this was a team where we were like, there's just no way. There's no way that they're as bad as everything keeps telling us that they are. And, yeah, it's just, it's just such bad luck. There, there's no way. that they, they can't be this bad. It's just the universe hates them. I'm sorry, Hartford. Yeah. It's like, they're, they're, they're not a great team. They're probably not even a good team, but like a team that could maybe flirt with that last playoff spot in the right. Atlantic, they should be in that neighborhood. Yeah. And they're just not. No. Not to mention too, like we said in the preview, like we knew that the Rangers were just not going to give a single, no. uh, single Have crap. ever? No. Uh, probably not. No. But like, they've never cared. And it's like, oh yeah, we're going to pull up Johnny Brodzinski so he can sit in the press box for two games and then send yeah. him back to you for no reason at yeah. all. But like, that's kind of, that was kind of baked into my understanding of this team this year. And it's just, yeah, that bottom six is so bad at creating actual <laughs> offense. All right. There's plenty more we could talk about Hartford, but I think that's a good place to leave it. Let's stay in the Atlantic division and go to chocolate town. The last time we talked about the Hershey Bears, we talked about two underperforming players, Shane Gersich and Zach Fucali. How have they been doing since the last time we looked at the team? First off, when I talk about Hershey, I feel like I need to start bringing props. I just need I just need chocolate like all around me because why not? It's chocolate. Um, so Shane, Shane Gersich, his slow start has sort of extended into December, but we're going to dig into that because, like we said, slow start. Right now, he has two goals, six assists, so eight points total in 17 games played. He went eight games to start his season without a point. He didn't record his first point this year until November 6th. So since then, though, things are looking up. He's gotten more consistent. Since November 6th, he has points in seven of nine. Uh, so we talked about him traditionally being a little bit slower in the first month of the season, and that is still holding true this year for Shane Gersich. This year, October, in the month of October, seven games – no points, six total shots on goal, including three games where he didn't get a shot off at all. Once we've moved past the month of October, which is apparently doom for him, um, looking at November, the first weekend of December, 10 games, eight points, 18 total shots. So it's just like, for whatever reason, the first month he's just sort of, you know, it's like me coming into work in the morning, like just easing my way into the day. And then around lunchtime, I'm like, all right, let's 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 get it going. It, he's kind of doing the same thing. If you look at his season total for shooting percentage, he's an 8%. Career average, 9.5%. If you look at November and this weekend of December, 11%. So everything is being dragged down for him by that one first month where just nothing happened. So he's trending up. And I think that, you know, he seems to be getting into more of a rhythm, but that he, he's, I, I would love to have the spare time to go back and look at like other past seasons. Like, is he all, is, is October always bad for him? <laughs> like, fun, yeah. fun fact about Shane Gersage and that first goal that got him off, off the, the offer. I was in the building for that one. Uh, he scored that right in front of me. Uh, it was about four rows back from it. And I remember thinking like, Yep, we literally just talked about the things yeah. you needed to do, the things you need to do better, and then boom, right yeah. away, like right in the first period, bangs one in. Yeah, he knew. He knew. Yeah. So there, there's for for players, teams out there, there, there's what you need to do. You need you need Sean in the room apparently to get that first goal. So you know we're listening to offers. You know DMs are open. My Venmo yeah. is available. So Zach Fucali also is a player who has looked better as the season's gone on. That first month of his also 
meh, not great. Um, right now he's 9-5-0-1, oh, um, 2.46 goals against average, uh, 900 save percentage. The numbers are co- sort of distorted by just an absolute stinker against the Penguins recently. He allowed seven goals in under 30 minutes. Um, we're going to come back to that game, though, because it says more about the team in front of him necessarily than it does him. Um, he did start November with a three-game win streak, um, only one game that he allowed more than three goals, and that was a terrible Penguins game. He had one shutout, which was a one nothing shootout win over Hartford. Uh, so, you know, the rare double shutout for both goaltenders there. Um, but let's go back to that game against the Penguins because it was just an uncharacteristically bad full team performance from Hershey. They're a team that is just generally, when I think of the Hershey Bears, I think they're going to be fine. Uh, and this was a game where it was just not, not fine. Things did not look good for them. Uh, shots were 24 to 18 in favor of the Penguins over the first two periods, uh, double digit shots for the Penguins in each period. Uh, they allowed two power play goals. Uh, and in the second period, the Penguins scored four, four goals within a span of about three minutes. Oof. So <laughs> just everything going wrong for the Hershey Bears there. Um, Fukali got pulled midway through the second period. After that, the team woke up and Wilkes-Barre got only two shots the rest of the period. <laughs> you know, so it, they, they needed to wake up. But of course, by that time, they're already in a seven goal hole. Like, you know, or yeah, it was, I think it was like five, set five, seven to two or something, but not great. Like you, you can't really, you just have to play out the rest of the game. <laughs> Most teams are not going to come back from that. Um, looking at the goals against, again, they're not necessarily goals that I'm like, you know, you should have, you should have had that one because they were all just weird. Um, the first goal against came after a shorthanded opportunity for the Penguins. Hershey never even got control of the puck again. Um, the uh, player who scored, Phil Hollander, that was his fifth goal of the season against Hershey. He's just a Hershey dot, like decimating machine. Um, it was a two-on-one for the Penguins. Hershey had a slow line change. It was just like a dysfunction of the players on the ice. The second goal came on the power play, was a deflected shot from right in front of him. Uh, the third goal was also on the power play, uh, had a lot of really good movement from the Penguins, and it looked like Fukali probably was screened by his own teammate on that one. Uh, the fourth goal... Uh, was just one of those weird plays where the goal ba- the puck bounces off the backboards, comes right back out to a Penguins player in front of the net. Um, what are you going to do about that? Uh, goal number five was a two-on-one after a scoring chance at the other end. Uh, Hershey just did not transition back very well, uh, and Penguins are off to the races. Uh, goal six came off of just a really weird angle. Uh, no one was covering the guy who, sw- who scored the goal, so he could have done whatever he wanted. Uh, Goal seven was a Bears turnover, and once again, the guy who eventually scored the goal was left completely open. So much like the last time we looked at Zach Fakali and his play, sure, there's some of those you wish that he probably would have stopped, maybe got moved over a little bit sooner or whatever, but this was largely the whole team breaking down in front of him and not pulling it together until after he got pulled. Um, The the goaltender who came in for relief of, of him only faced 10 shots, I believe, surrendered no goals, uh, so Hershey you know, got it together just a little bit too late. Uh, So in terms of our players who kind of got off to slow starts, things are looking better. And where they're not looking better, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's his fault. Overall, Hershey's currently second in the Atlantic. Um, They've won seven of their last 10. Uh, They have one of the best uh, penalty kills in the league, sitting at number four. Um, Of those losses, the three losses that they had, Two of those were lopsided losses to the Penguins. Um, in addition to that 7-2 loss, they also lost 4-0 uh, in November. Um, but otherwise, they're doing what you would expect of them, which is beating up on all the teams below them in the division. Uh, they won three out of four games against Hartford in November. Uh, so they're doing what you want to see a team in Hershey's position, position do. This is a team that overall, they're going to be fine. They're going to go to the playoffs. They've got some exciting young players to watch. Um, Hendricks Lapierre. Has 16 points in 22 games. Connor McMichael just got assigned. Uh, he has four points in eight games. Uh, so I, I, they're going to be fine, but it's just those the the lopsided losses just look real ugly in isolation. Yeah, Hershey's. I mean, Zach Fukali seems like he's had hot streaks and cold streaks throughout his career, um, yeah. and consistency is the problem of you know 90 percent of goalies that walk this earth. So yeah. if you're one of you know the handful of guys that year to year you can rely on uh, as a good goaltender 
uh, congratulations, this does not apply to you. The rest of it, this is why we say goaltending is voodoo. It's made up. Yeah. Like you might have a guy who's talented like Fukali is, but what you get out of him in a given game, mm -hmm. month, year. And that is that is true, not just of Zach Vukali, but of goalies at large. I mean, you could, you know, blindly just start pointing to the screen of the AHL goalie list and find someone that that's also true of. Yeah. Uh, Sarah covering the Ontario Reign. That's al also mm -hmm. Matthew Villalta. Yeah. It's been Antoine Bebo his whole career. Mm -hmm. It's get, like throw a dart. All of them. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the majority of goalies have, you know, struggle with consistency. Yeah. That's why it's always voodoo. Uh, yeah, that's seven, that seven goal game against Wilkes-Barre Scranton, especially too, it hurts because it's Wilkes-Barre Scranton. Like right. there are only two teams that the, the bear, like the bears fans, I feel like they would be like, if we could, you know, just sweep the phantoms yeah. and penguins, I don't actually care about the right. rest. Yeah. Like, Whatever. It, yeah. But it's those, those ones hurt a little differently too. Yeah. And especially here, especially this year, it seems like Wilkes-Barre Scranton has gotten it together a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I think having that extra, you know, body on the coaching staff helps. Yeah. Also, just Dustin Tukarski, you know, carrying that team kicking and screaming on some nights to win yeah. uh, helps a lot too. Uh, yeah. You show me a coach who's having success. I'll show you a coach who's getting goaltending well above average. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a good place to leave it though. We could talk a lot more about the woes going on in Hershey, like their power play. Another one of the teams like we talked about with Hartford not using the double drop, Hershey mm -hmm. is now one of them. Uh, why not? Why. I just just do the double drop or figure out a better way. Yeah. The center lane is something that's such a bad scheme that EA Sports stopped putting it in the NHL game <laughs> series like three years ago. <laughs> when EA Sports is ahead of you in strategy, you right, done bad. Let's go north, though. Let's talk about the center of the hockey universe, the Toronto Marlies, or, well, Toronto, and then the Marlies. Uh, Marlies are currently leading the North Division, but the gap between them and the rest of the division is starting to get tight. Uh, objects in the rearview mirror are getting closer than they appear. They have won just five of their last 10 games. What's going on with the Marlies, and when do they right the ship, Sarah? All right, so one of the biggest problems that the Toronto Marlies have is the Toronto Maple Leafs. So per HockeyReference.com, uh, eight different players are currently listed as injured for the Maple Leafs, uh, and that's not even included. Like, there's, there's, there's definitely at least one I know that isn't on there. Um, this also includes Victor Mete, uh, who was hurt the other night after getting caught up. He played like, I don't know, a game and then immediately got hurt. Um, they've used five different goalies this season uh, because at one point Toronto had no, the, the Maple Leafs had no goalies. Uh, they've repeatedly had to use emergency loans to call players up, um, including Semyon Deargu-Chinsev. De I even practiced it this time. Um, he just got caught up the other day. Uh, and we talked about him before, uh, whether or not he's poised for a breakout season. The answer is kind of like, meh, probably not. Um, but right now he's got 18 points in 20 games. But the call-up was based on merit as much as it was the Leafs need a body. Uh, basically everyone's hurt. Uh, he made his NHL debut against Dallas. He played just over seven minutes, no points. Uh, he was a plus one, so good for him. I uh, got fourth line minutes. Uh, and he was caught up after the uh, injury to Kali Yarncroft, who is going to be out for at least two weeks with a groin injury. Uh, so this is a good chance for SDA to show that he can play in the NHL uh, and at least just get a little bit of that experience. But the the Marley's biggest problem is just that all of their guys are now in Toronto. Um, so in some respects, it's not necessarily going to matter who's on the Marlies, how good they're coaching in is, how good special teams are. If their roster is currently constantly being poached because no one in the NHL can stay healthy, uh, then they're going to have a hard time maintaining their current rate of play. But then again, they're number one in the division right now for a reason. Uh, they, their five recent losses, one was just a blowout to Cleveland. Uh, they lost five to one. Uh, they took two penalties and allowed goals on both of them for a nice big goose egg in, in their penalty, cape, penalty kill percentage. Uh, they had a 3-2 loss to Abbotsford, where, again, they allowed two power play goals. A 6-1 loss to Belleville, where they allowed three uh, power play goals. So, you know, if you want to hint on something maybe they should work on, maybe look at that penalty kill, because some of those games could have been a little different, maybe, had uh, special teams not let them down. Um, for four of their five losses, Keith Petrozelli was in net for them. Um, he played primarily in the ECHL last season. At one point this year, however, he had to sign an NHL contract solely because the Leafs were out of goalies. Uh, he didn't get any action. He just sort of sat there. But 
this is how bad it has been uh, for Toronto franchise as a whole. Um, as the opposite of Zach Fucali earlier, Petrozelli had a great start to his season. He had six straight wins uh, to open his season, 922 save percentage, allowed just 15 goals over those games. Since then, he's had only one win, uh, 19 goals against in slightly over four games. Uh, there was a fifth game where he played just about 20 minutes in relief of another goaltender. Uh, but if things aren't necessarily looking great for him, but much like Hershey, some of these goals against him. Uh, so I looked at a, a game where they lost 5-3 to Syracuse. Goal number one, two Marley's players collided in front of him, lost the puck directly to Syracuse. Guess what? Syracuse scores. Uh, goal number two, the Marley's gave the puck away in their own zone. Uh, blind pass right to Syracuse forward coming into the circle. Guy shoots. What do you expect? You gave it right to him in front of your goaltender. Um, goal number three, the Marley's lost a board battle. Battle. Uh, the Syracuse score was undefended because everyone was on the other side of the ice. Uh, goal number four was a wraparound where the player collected his own rebound to put it in. Um, and goal number five came 30 seconds after that wraparound goal. Um, the Syracuse broadcast was actually talking about how uh, the the coach there, you know, one of his expectations, and every coach has this expectation, but you score a goal, we want you to come back and score another one. Well, guess what? Syracuse wins the faceoff, gets heavy traffic in front, scores the goal. There's at least three players directly in front of Keith Petrozelli and at least two more kind of scattered, like, you know, a couple of feet away. So I, I, you could have put the best goaltender in the world in that one, and I don't know how you would have seen it. So you can't pin all the Marley's woes on him particularly, but I think he does need to be better. Um, he's 6'6", but he doesn't necessarily make himself big. Uh, you wouldn't know necessarily that he's that big. He, he's, he, he's pretty deep in his net. He crouches maybe a little more than he should. Uh, I think he could take up a lot more space than he does. Uh, he's sort of slow in his movement, which might come with being 6'6". Uh, he seems to track the puck well, but his body isn't always moving along. Um, the reaction time isn't necessarily great. So I think these are things that can be improved on with him as he gets more used to playing in the AHL. Um, he only had five games at this level last season. But, you know, if, if he's who the Marlies are going to have to be relying on primarily in net right now, um, I think they're going to need to see a little bit better from him. But they're going to need to play better in front of him as well, like not turning over the puck directly in front of him. So fun fact here, we I actually just the other night uh, created a nice little graph uh, to display uh, games lost from starting lineup. And wouldn't you know it, it fits perfectly into what Sarah is talking about. Uh, so what this looks like here is basically oh, the yeah, size of the little ball is how many games you've lost. And the green to red scale, red being worse, is the value of those games lost. So you can lose, you know, games to guys like look at Laval down there. They've lost 125. It's one of the higher numbers. But they haven't really lost those games from guys that are super crucial to them. Whereas you look at Toronto, and it is not only the largest ball, <laughs> but also the reddest ball. So, oh, no. yeah. And like some of those, some, and it's not all injury because we don't have centralized injury reports in this right. league because that would make too much sense. No, why? But uh, it, it's, and this is not the perfect way to track something like this. Basically, what I did is I took the opening two game uh, rosters of each team and the starting goalie tandem from opening night, figuring that if you made it in the lineup the first two games, there was a reasonable expectation that you were going to be a, a part of this team this season. You know, nobody expects every guy to play 72 games or whatever it is, or every goalie to evenly split mm -hmm. that start at 36. But, like, you do expect guys from your opening night roster to be there for the majority of the season. Um, Toronto, 174 games lost. The runaway winner in the value of those games lost, because those guys are Nick Robertson, for one. Um, even if you didn't expect Nick Robertson to play for the Marlies all year, which I can say probably zero people did. Mm -hmm still that he they probably expected him to play more than what four games right three games well meanwhile he's riding the press box most nights uh, on the other side of town so <laughs> yeah the the marlies have not had good injury luck but they're a deep a deep franchise and they can pull a lot of guys just by saying look we can give you a chance to maybe play for the maple leafs mm -hmm. so eventually that's going to I, I think toronto eventually gets it together as the maple leafs get healthier um but yeah, that that stint for like two weeks where they where you know we really thought we were going to see the David Ayers redemption story in Toronto. <laughs> oh. It was close. It was could real close. You, could you imagine how much 
like the internet would have exploded yeah like if twitter hadn't broken already that like that will break it for good oh no that was that would have broken it <laughs> david ayers like pitching a shutout for the maple leafs as an emergency backup yeah. starting goaltender would yeah. have condemned the internet straight to hell <laughs> but uh, i think you know we've we've satisfied the requirement to talk about toronto for long yeah. enough they are they get plenty of media coverage from others that are not uh, just us so let's move on a little bit here and let's talk about the team whose jersey I am donning. Sarah, start us off. We're looking at the Cleveland Monsters. Uh, so we talked about them on our last episode, our little Thanksgiving show as a surprise so far this season. Uh, they've played a whole whopping four games since then. So this is going to be a little bit shorter of a segment as not much has changed for them. But Sean, the Monsters are hanging around. They're 10, 10 and 9 in 19 games do you believe yet? Are you a monsters believer that this team is at least kind of good? I don't, but I, I just want to say one thing before I get into why I don't think it's true. I can at least see a way that they can sustain this. And we'll get to that at the end. Like I started thinking about it and there is at least a path to keep, let, let this keep rolling for the monsters. I think it's super unlikely that it works out that way for them, but it could, but I don't. I don't believe in this team yet. I There are some good things here, but I cannot bring myself to believe with so many bad signposts along that road. Let's talk about some of the numbers and dive into the film because that's you know what we do here. All right. Fewest number of goals they've scored that the Monsters have scored and won the game. Four. Oh, no. Their first goal percentage, uh, meaning that they scored the first goal of the game. 36.8% of the games they played, they scored the first goal. That is 28th in the AHL. Teams that score the first goal win 66% of the age of the time in the AHL this season. And that's about a that's right in the, on the level that we've seen in previous seasons. It's one of the things that drove Chicago uh to such good regular season results is they were sco they were scoring first in like two thirds of their games and just cruising. Um, but they're the fourth worst de defensive environment in the AHL as uh, measured by my analytics. Their even strength goal differential is dead even. Their net penalty kill is 29th in the AHL. Their penalty differential is also negative, meaning they're giving up more power plays than they're drawing, which isn't necessarily too terrible, but with the 29th penalty kill in the league, yeah. Um, the power play is the best in the AHL at 32.4% raw percentage. But that's the highest any AHL team has finished in the, on the power play in the last 10 seasons on the AHL is 27.5% raw power play percentage. Not net, raw. I don't have historical numbers for uh, net power play, and I didn't feel like calculating them for the purposes of this show. Um, so even if they regress, so 32.4% is unsustainably high given how their even strength goal tone to differential, even strength goal differential looks. They need this power play to score because they're pretty much just playing to a draw five on five. So even if their power play regresses to 26%, which is still a top three power play in the AHL, no matter how you skin it, um, they're likely to lose more games because of it, because of how much that power play has driven their success so far this year. It's also been a calendar month since they've won back-to-back -back games. Uh, November 11th was the last time they won a back-to-back -back game. Their next scheduled game is, I believe the 11th. So yeah, that's not great. Or the 10th, it, you know, it's almost a calendar month. Uh, they, I was told there would be no counting. Um, and on film, they do score a lot of just weird kind of bouncy, fluky goals that like just, when you look at them, they don't feel sustainable. Let's look at their last two games. So they had uh, basically traded four to three games with Rochester, uh, one on Thursday, one on Saturday. So they scored seven total goals. Thursday's 4-3 to three loss over Rochester. First goal, Brandon Gaunt snipes one from the top circle. Legitimate goal. Second goal, backdoor 5-on-3 uh, goal for Bemstrom. He taps in. It's a 5-on-3, but still legitimate goal. Like, you can continue to score those. Um, third goal, rebound off the back wall, comes right to Luoto, and he just bangs it home. Um, that's as good a bounce as you're ever going to get on that puck. That's, that's not repeatable. Like, yeah, banging it into the open net is, but that bounce is just good fortune. Uh, two out of three out of Thursday's game. Okay. Saturday's four to three win over Rochester. First goal in the opening seconds is a harmless shot from outside that somehow generates a rebound that Michael Hauser can't handle or cover for like a good 
second and a half. I have no fathomable idea of how this rebound gets in. And Josh Jones just, eh, there it is, bangs it in. Like he had time and space to cover this puck off of a shot that should not have generated a rebound and just goes in. That's not repeatable. Second uh, goal, Luoto scores on a sharp angle after a pass in the slot just deflects right to him, wide open from like the bottom of the far circle, wide open net, he puts it in. Third goal, Brendan Gaunt hits, uh, gets hit in the pants standing at the side of the net and deflects in. No. Fourth goal, uh, Payne recovers a loose puck and snipes one. Legit. Seven Monsters goals scored on the weekend and three are, you know, legit repeatable goals. Like, all of them went in, but are you going to be able to tell me that you're going to do that again? Uh, three of seven. And yet, there's... Like through all of that, it's just it's hard to see them sustaining this path. This path, like especially because their defense has not been good. Uh, Jake Christensen is uh, currently, I'm assuming, injured. He hasn't played in a while. Uh, their goaltending is bad, and based on the guys who are in net for them, I don't see any reason to believe it's going to suddenly get better. Especially with the defense in front of them, they both kind of feed each other. Uh, but. There is one aspect to all this that makes me think that maybe, just maybe, this wild, you know, goofy boat race system can be sustainable for Cleveland. So schedules in the AHL are incredibly driven by division uh, divisions. They're very division opponent heavy. Uh, it's been that way since probably the dawn of the AHL. To reduce travel costs, you get fans of other teams in close proximity to make the drive by tickets, by popcorn, etc. The best penalty kill in the North Division is Belleville currently. They are 17th in the, in the AHL in net penalty kill and 19th in raw penalty kill. The highest ranked North Division goalie in save percentage who's played at least 360 minutes. Sarah, would you like to guess who it is? Highest ranked North Division goalie in save percentage who's played at least six games worth of minutes. Oh, man. I'm trying to think of who's over there. We're going to go with Anton Bebo. Nailed it. 909 save percentage, 24th in the AHL amongst goalies who qualify. The second is Michael Hauser and Hugo Olnefeld tied for 33rd at 900 save percentage. There are 32 teams in the AHL and, 30, and the second best uh, North Division goalie by save percentage who's played at least six games is 33rd. This is a division that by and large has bad goaltending and can't kill penalties. And since Cleveland's schedule is almost exclusively against those teams, and it just seems like the things Cleveland is good at, offense and offense via power play against bad goaltending, well, maybe, just maybe, that's how Cleveland can get away with this. Like, I don't think it's possible, but if at the end of the season they're like third in the division and going to the first round of the playoffs... <laughs> I cannot imagine another story we we're going to tell besides, yeah, they're not a very good team. Like they're not going to go far in the Calder cup playoffs, but this division can't kill penalties and doesn't have goaltending. So <laughs> screw it. Crack open a beer and get the popcorn. Cause this is going to be yeah, fun. Have fun. Like, and that they're doing it with like basically all of Columbus's blue line is dead. Yeah. So like the the monsters are doing this ridiculous whatever they're doing with like second third string guys and like ECHLers. Yep. Very weird. Yeah, like that doesn't happen. But and like it's not like they're looking good doing this. Like right. There are definitely moments on film where I've just hit pause and been like, "Holy Jesus, I need <laughs> a whiteboard and four colors of marker to explain how incredibly idiotic that was. But like it, they are the opposite of Hartford, the hockey gods for whatever reason are just like, you know what we go. Oh, you guys won. We're going to let you have like, whereas Hartford can't buy a goal. Cleveland is literally has so many goals. The fire yeah. marshal is about to come in there and throw some of them out. Like it's, <sighs> there is a path that this could possibly stick around, but, I cannot imagine that that's true. I just can't. I. All right. We are going to take a break here. And after the break, we will get to Manitoba, Milwaukee, Henderson, and San Jose. If you're just here for an Eastern Conference team and this is your jumping off point, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe if you're ever listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. 
Also check us out on social media. Links to our social media and more can be found at our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Calder Farmstead. We're gonna run some ads, pay some bills. We will be right back. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Calder Farmstead where we're talking about the latest, greatest, weirdest, strangest things happening in the AHL. Uh, we just wrapped up our Eastern Conference fun and excitement. We're moving to the West and we're starting out right now with the Manitoba Moose. Uh, the Manitoba Moose right now, they're getting by. They've managed to split each of the last six two game series that they've played. They've dragged a couple to overtime to steal a loser point and keep themselves afloat in the standings. So, Sean, what are your thoughts as to why Manitoba has just been getting by and not thriving or failing? Well, I mean, Jansen Harkins and Mikey Isamon have been gone for uh, about a month. Uh, I think Harkins left around thanks or around uh, Halloween and uh, Isamon like a week later, I want to say the 6th. So right after the 5th of November, he you know saw V for Vendetta uh, on the plane ride. Uh, plane ride. Wow, that is a deep level joke about Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Toninato uh, is supposed to be uh, coming into the Moose locker room uh, so that should help them uh, boost the sales a little bit but that's really all they've lost for longer than a game or two uh, everyone has pretty much been either reasonably healthy or when they've gotten called up they've been yo-yoed right back down um, the rest of the roster has played 75% of the Moose's games more or less or at least to the guys you would want there and expect there you know they've shuffled some of the fourth liners around, but that's not uh, out of the ordinary. And not to not to mention, they've been kind of an offense by committee as opposed to star power driven, you know, the stars and scrubs approach for like four or five seasons now in Manitoba. Uh, still losing two, uh, you know, key top six players will not do a team any favors unless I guess it's Evander Kane twice. Um, but Manitoba has also had a brutal schedule recently. Nine of their last 11 games have been against Texas, Calgary, or Milwaukee. That's the number five, six, and nine teams in the AHL by points right now. Um, they should improve as they have some series against Iowa, Belleville, Abbotsford, and Laval coming up, and those teams range from middling to bad. Uh, Manitoba's a good team, though. Their even-strength goal differential is positive. They're, they rank eighth in net power play and net penalty kill, so special teams are getting the job done. Their defensive environment's around league average. They've gotten reasonably good goaltending. Some good nights, some bad nights, but more good than bad. Uh, so getting by with a schedule, you know, dominated recently by tough teams ain't too shabby. Uh, I imagine the next time, you know, we come around to talking about Manitoba, we'll have better things to say than they're just getting by. But yeah, a lot of it for me is, you know, they're missing some some important guys, um, but they've managed with that. But like, they're they're having to play rough teams every night. They're not getting too many too many uh, reset games or uh, too many clunkers that they can kind of just scrape through. So they've they've played a rough schedule recently, and that's about to change. They have one series against Calgary, but then it's a lot of like Abbotsford, Laval, Belleville, uh, Iowa. So those are teams that if if we're still saying they're scraping by, you know, next month uh, around New Year's, we can talk about the problems that that's caused. But for right now, I think uh, battling to a draw more or less against those teams is not too shabby. Yeah. And that'll, that'll keep them going in this division. Yeah. Um, one of the moose, however, who's doing more than just getting by uh, it's 2021, 22 best hockey flow finalist and fellow Penn state alum, Alex Lamoche. He is over a point per game so far this season. And while he's been a solid contributor for the goals in two seasons past when he was out on the West coast, uh, he's never really been a fo focal point of an offense before. So what has changed this year for him? It's It's been a bit of a surprising year uh, for sure. Uh, as always, we pump the tires of Penn State alum on this show. He's currently the, in the 96th percentile of AHL forwards, according to the model. And to answer your question, I don't think a lot has changed. More that he's gotten a bit better at things he was always good at, and that's kind of fleshing itself out. Uh, Limoges has a high hockey IQ. He knows how to find soft ice in dangerous places. He's a good shooter, but he's never been someone who scores a lot by just ripping pucks past goalies who are staring that he's staring down. He's more of a guy that has a quick release. He adds deception by looking off goaltenders, by looking off defensemen, and he also positions himself well for rebounds, tap ins, tips, etc. But he doesn't just stand at the net front or stand in those spots, take 10 cross checks to the back 
and battle at the net fronts. Rather, he finds quiet space on the back door or he times his entries into that space for the right moment. Again, that's high hockey IQ. Um, just look at the last goal he scored against Milwaukee. Just finds quiet space on the back post where every defender just is watching the puck carrier. All five of them, you can freeze the screen and just see all of them are watching the guy with the puck coming at the bottom of the circle. And there's Alex Abose just at the back post. Oh, there you go. Puck in the net. And that's how a lot of his goals get scored. Every time you see a shot uh, on goal while he's on the ice, about a second later, you're going to see him kind of just buzzing around the crease. Like he is a good rebound hunter and knows how to time his entries into those, you know, dirty physical areas, the front of the net so that he doesn't have to bet. He doesn't have to spend, you know, two minutes getting cross-checked and need back surgery in the off season. But that's also why he's so effective on the power play in the bumper spot. He's not just at the front slugging it out, but rather finding space in that mid to high slot to be a quick one-time option on the Oshi play. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Oshi play, Basically, it's a play on the power play where the player on the wall puts a pass down to the player on the goal line, and he one touches that pass to the bumper in the middle of high slot, and he, then that guy one times the puck. Um, the Washington Capitals have been using this play for like six years now, and if you go to YouTube and search TJ Oshi power play goal, you'll see why I call it the Oshi play. That's basically how all of his power play goals are scored. Um, the other things about other thing about Limoges that's impressive is his patience, his shot discipline, and his poise. These are not things you normally are, you know, uh, uh, glowing up on a player, but he's really good at it. His shooting percentage is sky high, despite not shooting that often because he doesn't throw pucks away on the net on the low percentage chances from outside or from dead angles. He's patient. He'll work the cycle. He'll protect the puck, extend possession in the offensive zone instead of just hurling pucks on net from a distance that have basically no chance of going in. Even when he's under pressure, he has the poise, puck control, and vision to keep his cool and not panic that a defender is all over him like Penn Staters at the Rose Bowl, and he just goes to work. There's still a lot of little things that he needs to work on to become an everyday NHLer, or, or even at this point, a, an NHLer. I think he could be more valuable in transition as he's not someone you commonly see carry the mail through the neutral zone. I think defensively, he could contribute a little bit more. But a lot of the good parts of his game, that hockey IQ, that vision, that poise, that puck possession mentality, those translate real well to the show. So if he gets that call up to Winnipeg, uh, he may do some damage up there. I'm not saying he'll stick and he won't come back. I mean, fingers crossed, Penn Staters in the NHL is always what we're going for here on this show. But it, I, I think should he be able to improve some of those raw skills a little bit, you know, maybe add a step to his skating. His, his skating's about league average. He's not bad at it, but he's not great. Add a little more value in transition, a little more in defense. He could be someone that could, you know, maybe crack the Jets out of camp next year or a NHL team out of camp next year is a sneaky but useful bottom six score. Yeah, teams like guys like that, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's. It seems like we always pair these two teams up. So next time around, we're going to make sure that they are in separate corners because <laughs> they wear the same colors. They both start with M. They're in the Central Division. We are going to transition to the other blue and light blue team, the Milwaukee Admirals. The Admirals have been taking advantage of an uncharacteristically weak Central Division this year, and they're making the best of it. Uh, they currently occupy the top spot in the division, although Manitoba and Rockford, Rockford are both knocking on the door. Sarah, do you think the Admirals continue running away with the Central, or they need to start watching their backs? All right, so given the disparity in games played in the division, um, it's right now anywhere from 18 to 22 games, depending on the team. We're going to call on our old friend points percentage to look at this one to get a little more accurate read uh, as to where uh, teams are. Uh, so Milwaukee, top of the division by points, also top of the division by points percentage at 700. The things kind of shake out and look a little different from down there because Manitoba is not very far behind. They're at 639 in terms of points percentage. Rockford's at 605. Texas is just under them at 591. So that makes things look a lot closer than just strictly looking at points, which makes you think, yeah, maybe the Admirals do need to be looking in the rearview mirror at who's coming up behind them. Um, before the season started, the model, the model gave the Admirals a 78% chance of getting into the playoffs, 19% chance of winning the division. Uh, looking at it now, they have a 97.8% chance of making the playoffs. I think something catastrophic would have to happen, like their goalies just left and no one played goal. Uh, they'd still probably have a chance of getting in, though. 25.5% um, chance of winning the division. Uh, that puts them behind Rockford at 37.1% and Texas at 27.1%. Uh, uh, I believe. 
Um, as an aside, I'm actually excited for the next time we talk about Rockford on the show because they've been way more exciting than I've expected them to be. And I'm looking forward to the deep dive on uh, the Rockford Icehogs. Uh, but speaking of Rockford, the Admirals' next game is against them. Uh, so the matchups against Rockford uh, and Texas are going to both be way more important than usual uh, for the Admirals. Also on the schedule, though, over the next couple of weeks, they play Hartford twice, Chicago three times, and Grand Rapids twice. All of these are teams that we know are struggling this year, uh, so it's a great opportunity for Milwaukee to continue banking some points to increase that lead. Now, when we looked at Milwaukee at the start of the season, this was one team that we knew could be impacted by what Nashville does, and we're already seeing some of that. Um, Jordan Gross, Zach Sanford, uh, Yuso Parsonen, Mark Jankowski all have been spending time up in Nashville. Uh, they do have players who should arguably get, be getting looks in Nashville. Um, Tommy Novak, Kiefer Sherwood uh, was up for a little bit and is now, now down in the AHL. Phil Tomasino, maybe even if you squint and you need a fourth liner, John Leonard. Uh, Novak has 21 points in 20, 20 games. He's in the top 20 in overall league scoring. Uh, Evangelista, 17 points in 20 games, tied for fourth in rookie scoring. Nashville in the NHL is a team that's been struggling with depth scoring, and they've made some occasional tweaks to their lineup, so it's possible that there's going to be more changes coming for the Admirals as N Nashville kind of tries to find their own way to sneak back up into the standings. I also wanted to touch on goaltending um, and Yaroslav Askarov. Uh, last time we talked about the Admirals, he had some growing pains, you know, this being his first year in North America. Safe percentage was under 900, and frankly, some bizarre goals allowed. Uh, he has calmed down a little bit. The safe percentage is creeping up. He's at 908 right now. He had a six-game winning streak, and in the month of November, he only lost one game, which was a 5-3 defense outing, a defense optional outing against Chicago. Just every puck was going in the net on either side. Um, he can be a bit too aggressive sometimes in net, puts him out of position. He has to make crazy desperation saves. It's fun to watch unless you're a fan of the Admirals, in which case you're having a heart attack all the time. Uh, but, you know, not always great. You don't want to see your goaltender having to, like, throw himself back at the net to make a save. But those things are getting less frequent. He seems to be kind of calming down in net. You know, I don't watch him and necessarily get that, like, anxiety of stay in your home, where are you going, uh, that I had quite so much as I did when I saw him at the beginning of the season. Um, overall, the Admirals, they're fun to watch this season. And I think that's really the biggest takeaway for me having to see them like 12 times a year. Um, in past seasons, I don't know that I necessarily would have said the Admirals were fun. They had a lot of guys of kind of the same player profile of, you know, guys who they're going to be a grinder in the NHL, basically. Uh, and this year they have a lot more fun on offense. There's, there's just a lot more back and forth play with them. Uh, so I, I think that they're really making the best of the fact that Chicago is really bad because Chicago is usually – who they all have to try to get over. And this year, you know, they're probably, they have 12 games against Chicago. They're probably going to win eight of them, if yeah. not more. <laughs> I will say too, I agree that the Admirals have not always been a, an entertaining team to watch top to bottom in previous years. Like they had entertaining guys like Grimaldi mm -hmm. and Glass and mm -hmm. uh, Tony Rick. Like those guys were fun to watch, but like, and their power play was fun, but they did have a lot of like Mitch McLean's and, yeah. uh, you know, Ben Harper types that just were, you know, not not the most uh, entertaining to watch. Um, but it, the Admirals, too, have been a, an interesting team this year. I know in the bits and pieces I've checked in with them, Askarov has definitely gotten the make big save at key moment thing down pretty well. Yeah. It seems like every time I, I look at highlights or, you know, catch a period or two of them, he's making at least one save where, you know, the defense got totally burned or lost mm -hmm. a man. And it's just like, oh, no, that's okay. Askarov can handle that. So, like, he's still struggling in some aspects, but, like, he's definitely – you know, accelerating up that learning curve uh, at a, a pretty impressive pace, which, I mean, again, he was one of the most hyped goaltending prospects mm -hmm. we've had in the last decade. So like, if this wasn't the path for him, I think all of us would be sounding the panic alarm because yeah. goalies are, uh, goalies are voodoo and developing goalies <laughs> is voodoo squared. So yeah. it, it's, it's been interesting to see him. Does he still have the mustache? Do you know? I think so. I think it might just be his thing. Thing, I, yeah. That Top Gun movie, like worst thing to come out of it is now everyone thinks those mustaches look good, and they like I understand when it was November, you know the, the right November thing. Sure, I I just donated. I don't do the mustache, um, but like I was hoping that it, it you know December first, he you know he'd be having teammates chase him down in the locker room, uh, but 
no, if he still has, he should put that on his mask then. That'll definitely scare people away from shooting. I mean, whatever works, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's enough about Milwaukee. Uh, there's no need to dra continue to drag them down. Let's switch over and go to the Pacific Division. Let's talk about the Henderson Silver Knights. Sarah, start us off. All right. So in our Thanksgiving episode, we talked about what's going wrong still in Henderson. Uh, it's also only been a handful of games since then. So we're not going to dive back into them too much because who likes repeating themselves? Um, if you want to check that out, it's in our last episode. Uh, so instead, let's focus on a specific player, and that is Sheldon Rempel. Uh, Rempel had a breakout season last year in Abbotsford, uh, posting 33 goals, 36 assists for a 69-point season. That was eighth in the AHL in total points. He was also a finalist for the Calder Farmstead's Best Forward Award. Uh, this season has been a different story so far. He's got 14 points in 21 games, but it's not terrible, but it's also probably not what I think Henderson fans were hoping for coming off of last season. So have you seen anything that helps explain the dip in production for Sheldon Rempel this season? A few things, I think. Uh, one is that it's not for lack of trying. Here's the entire list of players in the NHL who have more shots on goal than Sheldon Rempel this season. Riley Barber, end of list. Uh, he's also doing a lot of the things that you want to see. He's creating high danger chances with his playmaking and positioning. His off-puck game is still very strong. He forechecks well. He's defensively responsible. But quality of line mates matters. Uh, last year, he spent a lot of time with guys like Sheldon Dries, Nick Batan, Phil DiGiuseppe. All three are basically in that space where like they're NHL call up guys, but they're when they show up in the AHL, they're you know making a list and taking names. Um, but this season, he spent the majority of his time with Gage Quinney, being centered by either Morozov, Manin, or Fraze, which you know those guys are not throwaway players that belong in the coast, but they're not to be, they're not being confused for NHL caliber talent and are firmly AHLers at this point. Morozov, you know, has more upside, but the other two are pretty much who they are at this point. I mean, even on the power play, there have been moments where Rempel has put these beautiful one touch passes across Royal Road and guys like Quinney or um, uh, Byron Fraze uh, weren't ready to blast at home OV style, which is what they were supposed to do. And part of me wonders if Rempel wouldn't be better suited uh, as a line mate for Pavel Dorofiev. Uh, I think their two sk skill sets would complement each other very well. Overall, I've seen good things from Rempel, but I think the downgrade in line mates is dragging him down a bit. I also don't think he shoots 7.7% all season, and I think that's likely to improve. Especially, too, is like he's creating chances. These will eventually start to go in at a higher rate. You have to believe. The, the gods cannot possibly curse you that much that long. At least that's what Hartford hopes. Um, but I, I, I think this will get better. He's definitely doing things that you'd want to see. Just pucks just not going in quite at the rate you would hope for yet. But that's been true pretty much across the board for Henderson on offense in general. So you also posted a graph on Twitter on Tuesday that focused on the bottom line of the Henderson Silver Knights, which I'm going to be honest, I'm looking at, I'm, this is, this is a terror, like terrifying, not because I'm afraid of them, but terrifying in like bad. Um, it featured Colt Conrad, Jermaine Lowen, and Cal Marino and said the Silver Knights should consider some roster moves in the bottom six. So can you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. So the Silver Knights, as we talked about in the last uh, Thanksgiving episode, have made some head-scratching roster choices this season. Uh, Isaiah Seville in the coast, hashtag Seville saves Henderson. Jake Bischoff uh, was running power play two last game instead of Peter Dilibatore for reasons. I mean, that's a choice. But going out in the offseason and getting Kyle Marino while keeping Jermaine Lowen is a head-scratcher. I mean, they both do the same thing. They're goons. Even if you buy into the nonsense myth that goons deter opposing teams from taking liberties on your team, which we're not going to go there right now, but in short, no. Um, the presence of two of them means that one of them must not be doing that intimidating job real well since he needs backup. Um, to make matters worse, Henderson frequently runs them out on the same line. Like, I don't know what poor Colt Conrad or Mason Primo or Connor Ford did to have to drag them around the fourth line for a night, but it's really not helping this team win. Henderson is 31st in the standings. They're getting outscored and outchanced at even strength right now. And you want to send two guys over the boards who 
at the same time, you want to send them both over the boards at the same time who only make offense happen by accident. Like grit, toughness, and physicality are not useless traits in hockey players, and having players with those qualities in the lineup has value. I understand that. Analytics nerd guy gets it. But you can find players with those qualities that can contribute in other more tangible areas in trades for future considerations or PTO signings from the coast. This fourth line just reeks of what Iowa did last year with Brandon Baddock and Cody McLeod on their fourth line. They were tough and gritty and difficult to play against, and Iowa missed the playoffs by four points. You'd think maybe if they could get some more offense out of that bottom six, they could have made two more wins happen in that 72-game season. But at this point in Henderson's season, I think it's a good time to suggest that maybe we try something else besides grit and toughness and guys who can't score in the bottom six. Like You can get checking role guys and guys who can fill penalty-killing places that can also chip in eight goals and 15 points a year. You don't need to drag poor Colt Conrad or Mason Primo or Connor Ford down by strapping two boat anchors to them. Like That's not necessary, and it's very clearly not uh, helping this team try and win games. So this is a moment in which I think Henderson needs to have kind of a, a real sit-down chat with the bottom six and make some moves to either shake up the roster from an external ad or start, you know, putting guys in the press box and giving other guys a shot. Can I share a Cal Marino fact before we move on? So he played on the Wolves last season um, and, you know, fulfilled that same, you know, I go out and punch people and then walk away, kind of like rolled. And that was that was his role. Everyone knew it. It was fine. He he actually got his first like AHL points with the Wolves, scored two, got two assists. assists. There was a game where the Wolves had run up the score so much that Ryan Wasowski put Cal Marino out on the power play just to see maybe he could get a goal. It didn't happen, but like he was like, why not? We weren't going to lose the game. It was like end of like end of the third period. Like there was no way it could have gone wrong. Um, so Cal Marino does have. I know the AHL doesn't share ice time, but he does have in there a small amount of power play time with the Chicago Wolves uh, because why not? <laughs> You would think that like taunting to that level would be a, a foul in the AHL, but you'd think, but the other so, thing too, that I want to point out is even like for the role that he had for the wolves, they knew he wasn't that yeah. critical to their success. He played yeah. what 24 games last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. In the Calder cup playoffs, you know, the most critical games that you can play all year. How many games did Kyle Marino play Sarah? Two. And I think it was just because people were hurt. In Milwaukee, it was the Milwaukee yeah. series. He played two games yeah. and the three out of the four playoff rounds that Chicago played, including the last two, sir, not appearing in this film. So yeah. like, Maybe. yeah, he won a Calder Cup and nobody can ever take that away from him. But at the no. same point to say that he fulfills this massively critical role. Well, the team that won the Calder Cup didn't think so. Yeah. All right. I think that's enough beating up on Henderson for that segment. Uh, let's go beat up on another Pacific Division team. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the San Jose Barracuda. Uh, neither of exp us expected the Barracuda to be necessarily good this season, but they're currently hanging around the top half of the Pacific Division and have, as we talked about the last time, one of the AHL's best penalty kills do we need to reevaluate our position on the, the Cuda Sarah, or is this maybe not quite as impressive as we thought? Yeah, I'm going to give them a very, very generous maybe. Um, right now, the model projects them to be the last team to get into the playoffs in the, again, ridiculously oversized, there should not be this many teams in the Pacific Division. Um, and it's not even close. Uh, the model right now projects them to finish at 81 points, way ahead of Bakersfield, who's projected to finish eighth with 67 points. So to, you know, let me just yes. jump in for one quick yes. second here Matt to be first. very fair to Bakersfield. Yes. The model doesn't know or believe that any of the people that are up in Edmonton or hurt are coming back. So like, because that trying yeah. to get that into the model yeah. introduces my own subjective, stupid judgments. Right. Like, Oh, of course some player is coming back at this date and we can put, you know, boost yeah. their, that like I don't know that nobody knows that we're probably pretty sure they're coming back, but they don't have to. So the model always assumes that the roster you have now yeah, is the one you have the it. rest of the season. And yes, yeah. that bakes some inaccuracy into it, but 
There is no better way to do it in an objective fashion. So, sorry, Bakersfield isn't actually that bad at the end of the season, but go, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's hockey. You never know. Something yeah. catastrophic could happen. Um, but, you know, regardless, San Jose still projected to make the playoffs. Are they going to get much further than that first round or the, you know, whatever weird play-in nonsense they're doing? That's debatable. Um, you're going to have to assume that some of their better players are going to wind up in San Jose at some point after the trade deadline because, you know, if that could, pun only sort of intended, tank the Barracuda. If they're having to rely on ECHL players because San Jose traded away a bunch of guys because they are also really bad this year. Um, so maybe, maybe is the answer on San Jose. Um, I watched them last month when they were in Ontario, and I'll be honest, like, they're a team that when I was watching them and looking at where they are in the standings, I was like, how are they this high in the standings? They looked horrible in that game against Ontario. Lots of basic errors up and down the lineups from both veteran players who shouldn't be making those errors and also from the young players who, you know, Thomas Bordalo makes a mistake. I'm like, all right, whatever. You're, you're a kid. Like you'll get it. You'll get it. Um, these veteran guys make mistakes. I'm like, what do you, why, why did you do that? You know, turnovers, miscommunications, uh, just wasn't a strong game. Um, no one who you wanted to see have a good game had a good game. Um, I was excited to see some of the kids, you know, Bordelow and Eklund, I know are really highly thought of by Sharks fans and, and the organization as top prospects. And they both just looked awful in this game. Um, Ito Makinemi was in net for them. I wouldn't put a ton of that game on him. Um, it was a 5-1 loss, I think, or 5-1 or five two I think um I wouldn't really put a lot of it on him he he just the team in front of him allowed a lot of odd man rushes a lot of blown coverage uh McEnany should be familiar with the odd man rush from his time in Chicago because that's all the Wolves did at the beginning of last season but you know at the end of the day just th this is a team that their spot in the standings is not matching up with the eye test of watching them play the game um I do appreciate their tenacity uh, there was a recent game where they won in overtime after being down 2-0 to Tucson. Um, it was actually a pretty rare failure of their penalty kill. Uh, they allowed two goals uh, on their penalty kill, including the game-tying goal at the end of the third period. So, you know, everyone has a bad night, I guess. Uh, they're 6-4 in their last 10 games. Uh, they've overall been playing in a lot of close games. Uh, their f last five games all have been won or lost by either one or two goals. So they're not necessarily getting blown out. Uh, the PK does continue to be uh, critical to their success, uh, which is important because they've been shorthanded 107 times this year, which is the most in the AHL. So on the one hand, if you're going to be shorthanded that often, you better make sure that you have a good penalty kill. On the other hand, stop making your players work so hard. Stop taking penalties. Stay out of the box. I, what do I know? Uh, the penalty kill does continue to have that very aggressive style. They put a lot of pressure on puck carriers. Uh, the game against Ontario, they only allowed one power, one goal while on the penalty kill. Um, the rain, you know, their power play is not as good as last season, but that is driven by like absolutely abysmal numbers on the road. Um, not to shift to talk about the rain, but their power play on the road is literally last in the league. At home, they're fourth. So for Ontario to be limited to just one power play goal on the advantage by uh, San Jose was pretty significant, even in a game that the score was already getting run up on. Uh, this feels like a team similar to what we talked about with Cleveland, where fans should just be happy to enjoy the ride. Are things going to come crashing back down eventually? Uh, statistically, probably at some point. Um, but you're getting to see some of the Sharks' top, top prospects grow and mature as players here. Uh, like I mentioned, Bordelo and Eklund, uh, they're number two and three in scoring on the team. Uh, so they're at least providing a lot of entertainment. Um, the, the, the Barracuda are having a much better season than they did last year. And they're outperforming expectations. So have fun now before things change, before, like you mentioned, Bakersfield gets back guys from Edmonton and then suddenly is <laughs> much better again. Uh, things can change. So they're fine. Do I think it stays that way? Mm, there's still a lot of season left. Uh, I do want to pull up really quickly here because I just looked it up and it's absolutely wild. And I believe it was wild last year too. Their uh, two-week rolling PDO graph. So give me a second because I'm pulling it up from the desktop version because for whatever reason, Tableau is doing weird things to colors on some oh. of the logos, which I have not figured out and has driven me absolutely mad. But all right, let's pull this up here. Rolling estimated PDO. You. 
this. So this is basically every team's rolling two week uh, measure of puck luck. And what that means is every two weeks, it uh, adds those two weeks together. And you can see these big spikes up and down and all over the place because that's how puck luck works. You get lucky, you get unlucky. It balances itself out. This is San Jose. Like oh. that is, that is oh, wow. the bouncy, like <laughs> that is ugly. They started out as red hot, went down to literally the lowest mark. I think <laughs> I've seen in a long time. It's currently the lowest in the entire graph by any team. And they shot straight back up to uh what is this? One Oh one, which is <laughs> high. And now they're back down to 98. So like, yeah, they've ridden the puck luck train all over the place this season. Uh, but I thought that was worth bringing, you know, uh, I know I brought analytics to an eye test fight, but That's all right. I, I thought that was worth mentioning that like, yeah, th it's been a ride for them. It's been a journey. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that's a good place to call it. Let us do what we normally do to end our show. And that is start bench ship our fun little game that we created. Uh, you may be familiar with it. If you, even if you've never heard us uh, play it, it's uh, basically our version of a, friend mary kill we'll, we'll go with that sarah are you ready i am ready first start bench ship we're going to do is ahl rivalries and yes there are many other rivalries i picked these three um so uh that is syracuse and utica san diego and ontario and chicago rockford sarah kick us off who you start and who you bench and who you shipping all right. I, I feel like you made this hard giving me like two, two, two of the three have teams that I cover. This is hard. Um, we're going to start the rain and the gulls. Um, I feel like they, you know, when the Pacific division came into existence, when, you know, everyone sort of committed to actually putting teams in California and making this happen, uh, the gulls and the rain were pretty much natural enemies from day one. Um, if you go to the, go to one of those games, it is just a heck of a time. Uh, and, both teams have been kind of similar. Like it hasn't necessarily been lopsided uh, in recent years when, when they've both been bad, they've both been bad, uh, but still, still a fun time. Um, we're going to bench Syracuse and Utica um, just because I had to put someone there um, because I want to ship Chicago and Rockford. And the reason I want to ship this is because Every every season, and this one is going to be interesting because the Wolves are so bad this year, but every season has been so lopsided. Um, the Wolves generally, so if, if you don't know this, the Wolves and the, and the Ice Hogs have the like Illinois Lottery Cup, basically, that is awarded to the team at the end of the season who wins the most games out of their um, their head-to-head. -head. Uh, the teams are like an hour apart driving, so they're, they're naturally, they hate each other. Um, the Wolves usually win it. Uh, there, there's not, hasn't been a lot of question. Every so often Rockford pulls out something exciting, but um, I like this, this, it's just, there's no, there's no drama to it. Um, and so we're shipping it. We'll let them think about what they've done uh, down the ECHL where a uh, discount version hammy belongs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I am going to follow a very similar path here. I'm going to start San Diego versus Ontario. I feel like of all of the fan bases, those are two of the bigger ones because they, you know, represent two just more densely populated metro areas. But they they definitely like those teams. It it seems like anytime they play, you can throw the records out. It doesn't matter if one team is more talented than the other. They find a way to make these gritty, ugly, like hate filled games, and it's mm -hmm. beautiful. Both fan bases also travel really well, invade the other team's place, but like not in a, you know, Boston kind of way where there's four fights in the stands. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to bench Chicago Rockford. I, I get what you're saying about uh, the, like, it's it seems like it's always kind of one team just runs away with it. I think it's funny that last year, despite Chicago, you know, winning the Calder Cup, uh, Rockford won the season oh, yeah. series eight games to four. And like, uh, what is it? Uh, friend of the show. Oh my God. From center ice. Why can I not think of her name? Even though I definitely know it. Courtney dagger. Uh, but like was going to have that like game where they won, like, was it eight, nothing or something like yeah. tattooed on her. Yeah. Um, no, that. Yeah. 
It's just one of those where it's just like Chicago was so dominant last year and they just couldn't get past. They just phoned it in every so often. Rockford. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm shipping Utica Syracuse for one very simple reason. Like those two teams do not like each other and the pettiness is beautiful. The fan bases don't get along. But is the other one the other's main rival or is it Rochester? Mm. I don't know the answer to that. Like, I, I think that like those two teams clearly don't like each other. And even my, one of my favorite little little notes is if you go to the Utica Comets Reddit page, the downvote button is the Syracuse Crunch logo, <laughs> which like that is pettiness on a beautiful level. Beautiful. But, like also Utica and Rochester hate each other's guts. So like, is that even Utica's number one rival? I, <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't put all three of them in the graphic. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. So they're getting shipped for exactly that reason. Just throwing it out there. All right. Next up here, we have first quarter MVP. So we're at the we're at about the you know first quarter, uh, rounding into the first third poll, and uh, we have three guys who are kind of standing out in my mind. There are other people who can clearly make their case, but uh, I, I will go first here. Start bench ship Dustin Tokarski, Sammy Walker, and Matthew Phillips. And I'm going to start Sammy Walker here. All right. He has 21 points and the next closest forward to him has 14. Like he is single-handedly carrying a not very good Iowa team to like competing for a playoff spot in a, a central division. That's all kinds of weird this year. Like that team is not good, but kicking and screaming Sammy Walker has dragged them to be a, a more respectable team than they are. Like, could you imagine, like he has 10 goals on the season. And yes, I'm positive that that shooting percentage is not going to stay at, what is it, like 26? <laughs> but that's the point right now. Could you imagine if this team did not have this 10 goal, 11 assist, 21 point guy on their roster right now? Like Iowa would be historically bad if that was the case. Uh, I the gap between him and the next best forward on his team in terms of scoring output. I don't know how you like that puts him in this conversation and has him at the top for me. Um, second, I have Dustin Tokarski. If we're going to talk, I'm going to bench Dustin Tokarski here. I, if we're talking about guys who are carrying a not great team uh, to new heights, kicking and screaming, Dustin Tokarski is also very much has that case. Um, he like, Wooksbury Scranton hasn't been bad in front of him per se, but they don't give him a lot of goal supports. They're they're not a highly offensive team. He has saved their bacon several times and has taken a team that has decent offensive talent and decent defensive environment to a place that they don't belong. Like he's putting up what nine thirty eight save percentage right now, and has so many games that he's helped them hold like these two to one leads where he's just making key save after key save like. He is carrying that team, kicking and screaming to the spot that they're in in the standings. Whereas, like, don't get me wrong, Matthew Phillips is really good. I, I think in the end game, he's probably going to end up being either like the next TJ Tynan and Sam Annis, or some team is going to take a shot on him in the NHL. Because unfortunately, he's no longer wa waivers uh, ineligible or waiver. Like, he has to go through waivers if he gets called up, which I think has probably shot his chances at the NHL in Calgary in the foot because. Someone will definitely claim him if he gets sent down. So I, I, I'm i going to ship him to the coast, even though he belongs in probably that other league. Sarah? Um, I have a pretty similar approach to you, but I've flipped my start and bench, um, but largely for the same rationale. Uh, I start Dustin Tokarski, like we've talked about. He is the main reason for that Penguins team being, uh, even in the conversation, as being interesting and <laughs> good to watch. Um, Sammy Walker, I don't know that I realized, uh, exactly how big the disparity between him and the next high, highest score was, but I already committed to, to my, to my order, so I'm not going to change it. Uh, but I mean, if, if you bench him, if he doesn't exist, uh, Iowa might be down there hanging out with Chicago in, uh, <laughs> in the standing Chicago might actually look a little bit better. Maybe if they don't have anyone who can score goals there. Um, I am shipping Matthew Phillips largely because I'm incredibly tired about the discourse of why isn't Matthew Phillips getting called up. I'm tired of it. I don't want to see it I'm, anymore. I'm over it. Um, I, I would like to ship him so I don't have to listen to it. 
I think that's actually quite fair. I, I'm, I've grown tired a little bit of the discourse because it's like, like he's doing so well, he deserves. Shit. I'm like, yeah, but you have to put him through waivers if he doesn't work out. Right. And like, you either he plays a game that you can't put in fourth line energy minutes. Like, mm-hmm. and even at the AHL level, he's still very dangerous, but he gets pushed to the perimeter there. What do you think yeah. is going to happen at the NHL level? Like, yeah. there are reasons that he's there and he's still very good. And I hope it works out for him. I root for small guys being one of them, but like to act like it's some crime against humanity, I think is, uh, yeah, I'm with you there. All right. Last one, AHL events. So we have the outdoor classic, uh, the all-star skills competition, and then the all-star game itself. Sarah, kick us off. All right. Um, I am starting. Oh, this is hard. I'm going to start the outdoor classic. I think, you know, in the NHL, outdoor games are kind of overdone. There's like, I feel like you blink and there's six of them, whatever. Um, the NHL hasn't done one in a while. Uh, and I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, <laughs> it's between two teams who, like we've talked about, like it might not be the best hockey anyone's ever seen uh in this year's outdoor classic but i think it's you know something fun for the league uh that doesn't happen a lot and should at least get some attention uh we're benching the skills competition i have nothing against the skills competition i actually like it a lot um you know you you see martin firk murder a puck at 109 miles an hour and that kind of lives with you for the rest of your life um i am shipping the all-star game because like god just no sport has found a way to make the actual game interesting (laughs) I thought the NHL did a pretty good job of the like three on three divisional game. The winning mm-hmm. team gets a million dollars to spit split between them. That at least generated some yeah. more, more trying than in previous years. Honestly, what they should do is, I don't know if you've ever played the EA sports series where they have the threes mm-hmm. where they have the like, all right. So it's basically a three on three tournament. There is no neutral zone. There are no lines on oh. the ice. At all. And like they paint the ice, this like crazy cool design thing. Huh. Um, so there's no offsides, no two line passes, none of that. It's basically just wide open pond hockey, yeah. and uh, they have and the, like the rink is smaller. It's like a quarter, maybe half the size of a full mm-hmm. rink. So like you can get back on defense pretty easily. Yeah. But they also have these little cool things uh, called money pucks, where you can either like if you score, it'll count for like two points or three mm-hmm. points, or it'll take points away from the other team. Like little oh. fun wrinkles like yeah. that. that all star game should that be. would Give be very fun. Yes, a three on three all star competition that is just NHL three. Like, yeah. EA Sports got a thing right, guys. Please don't <laughs> let all that good work go for nothing because it's the only time they do it. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> I am starting the skills competition that is far and away the most fun part of all star weekend, as you said. The game itself, uh, sure, like the players aren't trying that hard, it's not worth the price of the tickets. But the all star skills competition is bragging rights. You are that fastest skater that beat McDavid. You have that forever. You are the hardest shot. You have that for at least as long as it takes for Zidane Chara to get wheelchaired out there next year. Um, I'm going to bench the Outdoor Classic. I love the, the the atmosphere of it. I think it's a very – I agree that the NHL really overdid it. Um, but they st- like it's still on my bucket list to go to a Winter Classic this year. And – if other things that required my financial attention weren't happening this year, I would probably be going to the one in Fenway Park, um, but I'm not. Uh, but the only thing I will say about the Outdoor Classic that isn't great, that is an inevitable part of the game being outdoors and cold weather, is it's freezing ass cold outside. It's and outdoors, like, yeah. That's, that's the whole point. So, like, <laughs> standing in this big stadium in the freezing cold in you know January or whenever they do it. Definitely a downside that doesn't exist in the skills competition. We're yeah. shipping the all-star game. Nobody nobody tries until you make it literally NHL threes, which please someone do. It's Love it's it. the, what the NHL does now with the mini division tournament is probably the best it's going to get. And that's, that's fine. All right. That's our show. Sarah, kick us off on the outro. All right. So, of course, as always, thank you so much for watching or listening uh, to the show. The Calder Farm Set is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great hockey, sports, and sports entertainment programs at www.fullpresscoverage.com. Just click the podcast's drop-down menu in the top right portion of the website and enjoy. 
And if you guys are enjoying the Carter Farmstead, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, please, 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 please rate and review the show. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show as shows with more ratings, more reviews, more comments, more likes. They get shot to the top of searching uh, for AHL podcast or something like that. So they, they do help us. And your reviews also help us improve it. We do read them. You know, if you give us some constructive criticism, we'll we'll listen. Maybe. Uh, you can also follow the show on social media at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Links to all of that and more can be found in our Linktree page, which is linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. Big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at ad underscore dysfunction. That's ad underscore dysfunction. So he can make music for you too. Sarah, where can people find you? All right. My name is Sarah Avampato. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at right said Sarah. It's W-R-I-T-E said Sarah with an H. You can check out my writing at Full Press Hockey, where I talk about the Ontario Reign, or over at Kane's Country, where I talk about the Chicago Wolves. Sean, where can people find you? I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S-E-A-N-O-B-R-I-E-N 81. I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. My Instagram and Twitter are both personal accounts. I am not a journalist. Uh, I am a professional dickhead on Twitter um, for <laughs> hockey players and hockey teams. So, um, but all of the stats work that I do, all the graphs that you've seen and you know have seen floating around social media, uh, they go on my Twitter first and foremost. That's when they're updated or when they're first updated, that's where you find it. You also find my random musings about things like uh, the new Netflix show Wednesday, which was two thumbs up. Um, you can find all of my stats work also on Tableau at bit.ly slash data dump and chase. All lowercase, all one word. Thanks for tuning in for the show. For Sarah Avampato, I am Sean O'Brien. And as always, please dump and chase responsibly. <laughs>